Mr. President, will you say the magic words? At 12 noon on this day, acting in my capacity as President of the United States, it is my high honor and privilege to declare Expo 74 officially open to all the citizens of the world. Back in 1974, much of the world's attention focused on Spokane. Momentarily, the country put aside issues like the Cold War, the energy crisis, and Watergate to kick off the bicentennial, think about the environment, and welcome the world to Spokane. Millions came here to see a World's Fair. In six months, these visitors were gone, but Spokane remained forever changed. For 20 years now, people have cherished these 100 acres of land. Riverfront Park is Spokane's crown jewel. Its existence is the fulfillment of a dream, a dream accomplished by the most ambitious undertaking this city has ever seen. It took the power of both man and nature to create this park. The saga of its birth is the story of Expo 74. So join me, Allison Cardival, as we look back at this story in Reflections by the River of Expo 74. These falls have always brought people together. In centuries past, the roar of tumbling water guided Native Americans to tribal gatherings on the riverbanks. Later, the promise of harnessing some of its power encouraged pioneers to settle here. Then slowly, without people giving it much thought, the beauty of this place became obscured by progress. Before there was a park, and before there was a fair, this area was covered with the skeletal remains of an industrial empire. Spokane was built on industry. Its heart and arteries were forged from railroad steel. Its first decade saw prosperity, but in the 60s, the times were indeed changing. What was the Spokane area like in the 60s? It was very charming, it was very peaceful, and it was very much behind the times. Uh, we, we had just really not kept up with uh, the, the, the state, with the region, and even with the nation. It was a very comfortable place to live, but the economy was stagnant. Uh, culturally, why we were just not in, in keeping with uh, the rest of the, of the world, and uh, something had to be done. Nowhere was it more blatantly clear that something needed to be done than here in this area. Now it looks out into Riverfront Park, but in the 60s, this was Spokane's Skid Row. It was urban blight. It was uh, Trent Avenue, which is right now the street that's right out in front of the Opera House, uh, which became Spokane Falls Boulevard, was a series of shops that were uh, less than your 
most ideal shops in the city. We had two levels of railroad that came right down Spokane Falls Boulevard, Trent Avenue then. The two levels of railroad and two railroad stations completely blocked off the river from the core of the city uh, and took what people of Spokane did not realize was an island and of course uh, had marshalling yards and railroad yards and warehouses on that island as well as, as, as I mentioned, one railroad station. Um, so they, they took this, this gem of a piece of property and over the course of time had developed it for their own use. I used to be a newspaper reporter here and covered the county courthouse and would walk from, from the uh, newspaper offices across the Monroe Street Bridge to the uh, uh, courthouse. And in those days, we had, there were all kinds of railroad trestles going across the River Gorge. And uh, I used to think what, how fantastic it would be if we could do something in this community to uh, bring back the river for people's use and that the people of Spokane, not just the people traveling on the trains, could uh, see the falls, which are really the heart of this community. So it's kind of in that vein and in that spirit that as the Expo project unfolded, and it started out as a centennial celebration and also kind of a continuance of some urban renewal planning for the city. And, and uh, I just got caught up in that. And at the Jack time, Garrity was, was not the only person who got all caught up with the idea of a World's Fair. King Cole was hired by an organization called Spokane Unlimited in 1963 to work on rejuvenating the downtown area. I wasn't thinking of World's Fair. I was thinking of, of something that would be a re a regional at least in attraction, national in, in scope as far as a theme and so forth, and that would uh, be able to attract outside money uh, for the event. We hired a, a consultant firm uh, this is after I'd been here for about five years. And we'd done some things already. We'd, we built the parkade uh, downtown and uh, put in trees and street lights all over the downtown. Did a lot of things that we could be done to try to get the downtown back on its feet because it was pretty bad. The reason that the World's Fair appealed to me was that uh, if we could pull it off, was that, that it, would, it would do things for the community that you didn't have to do for, that you couldn't do for yourself. It would bring people into the community who would spend money, uh, and some of that would be left in residual benefits in physical construction, and it would bring attention to the community in a way that only large cities can, 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 can do, and which we couldn't do as our, in, in and of ourselves. But could this little industrial town really put on a World's Fair? As the 60s drew to a close, Spokane only had about 170,000 people in it. No city that small had ever held a World's Fair before. Plus, outside the region, its name was virtually unheard of. However, it did have one thing going for it, an unusually strong group of potential leaders. One of the, of the most amazing aspects of Expo 74 and Spokane and the Spokane community was the truly unusual level of leadership that emerged as part of the Expo 74 project. And uh, admittedly, a lot of these people were, were leaders in the community, uh, but uh, uh, being very pragmatic about it, there really wasn't a heck of a lot to lead back in those days. But there were people like Rod Lindsay with Lincoln Savings, Luke Williams, who headed up the uh, state's Expo 74 commission, uh, people like King Cole, and uh, the list goes on and on of these truly remarkable people that, that came forth and without whose leadership, this thing never would have happened. Most of these leaders, including Luke Williams, came from the business community. Well, that's really the way it's supposed to be in America. You know, I mean, uh, up until recently, the private sector was the initiator of a lot of projects throughout the, the whole country. We didn't even have a Department of Urban Renewal in Spokane, and so there were, just weren't any other sources of money, and uh, I think that's one of the good things, because if, if we had been waiting for the government to do something, we probably might still be waiting. Another key factor to Expo's success was the homegrown nature of these leaders. People on my board, I had 30 people on the board, and about 20 or 21 of them owned, their, owned the business that they were in, uh, and, and th therefore didn't have to call to Seattle or New York to get permission to do anything. 
and could, if they sat around a table, and they'd never tried this before, but, but if they could, if they would get in a single room and sit around the table, they could, if they wanted to, uh, come up with enough money to make something like this happen, seed money. And uh, so uh, after that picture was painted to the leadership that, and the board that I was consulting to, they decided that they ought to give it a try. They gave it a try to the tune of more than $5 million. Members of the business community wanted this area cleaned up so badly, initially they put up $1.3 million of their own money in an attempt to just get the site approved. Their seed money was not guaranteed, and neither was success. Well, everyone knew there was some gamble to it, but they also were pretty intelligent people. But the uh, uh, most of the money, the seed money, came from two sources, and and uh, the rest of them, it wouldn't have hurt uh, either of those sources if they'd lost the money. And the other people, for lesser amounts, uh, it wouldn't have killed anyone. Sure, there was a risk of loss, but it wasn't. It wouldn't have been calamitous in so far as their individual businesses are concerned. The decision to try for a fair was the first step, but there were many obstacles ahead. Besides getting approval from the International Exposition Committee in Paris, the site itself had to be acquired from its various owners. Fifteen of the 100 acres, which is now Riverfront Park, was owned by three railroad companies. Looking over the area now, it's hard to imagine the train tracks and trestles that dominated the landscape. But one reminder of this time is the People's Wall. Residents now use it as a canvas to express themselves to the rest of Spokane. But this mass of concrete is really an abutment for a train trestle that used to tower ominously over the Monroe Street Bridge. King Cole says dealing with the railroads was like negotiating with world governments. People didn't even want to start because they, could, they, they couldn't see how it could be done. And we just, started, we just decided to start. We had to because they had to be off of that property. It had to be done. People said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the number one objection. Where are you going to get the money? So we went to see the railroads, and we got them to tell us how much it would take. And when they got finished, we said, would you give us your figures, please? We want to go back east and see the, your bosses back east, and, and we're going to ask them to donate. The next thing was that we had such good cooperation from our major uh, shippers in the railroad here that, and they knew, they, if they weren't a major shipper, they knew people and had good friends who were elsewhere in the country. And they, can, they developed a network and got the railroads to listen to the right people. So by the time the people in Portland and Seattle had finished their work and no, very incredulously hand, handing it to us, shaking their heads, we were back in, in, we in St. Paul and New York uh, talking to the chairs of the board and so forth. The long story short is that uh, four railroads became two, and they got off of the site uh, about 20 years earlier than the earliest anybody had dreamed possible, and all of them, and we didn't pay a cent for it. They donated all of it. Gaining ownership of the proposed site in 1972 was a major victory, but many other things also needed to happen if there was going to be a fair here. The idea of having a World's Fair in Spokane initially developed eight years before opening day, yet time was still running short. That was just barely enough time to do it. I mean, it takes a lot of time to make these things happen. For example, just getting your own city council to, to, to do what it has to do so that the state government will do what it has to do because it won't do what it has to do until the city has done it. And the federal government, which won't do anything until the city and the state have done something, those things are all like ladder step, steps on a ladder and they have to be built one ladder step at a time to make it happen. Another rung on that ladder was public opinion. They range from people in Seattle saying, for God's sake, don't embarrass our state. You can't put one on successfully to grab it, go for the gusto. So everything in between was there. In 1971, local opinion created the most pivotal point of Expo's development. By and large, I, th I think the people of the city were uh, uh, almost had a wait-and-see attitude. The, on the one hand, the possibility of a World's Fair in Spokane was very intriguing. But on the other hand, some of the things that that might bring uh, was uh, certainly not. Uh, there was a vote. There was only one vote. A lot of people have, are confused about this. There was only one vote 
that the community wide vote that had anything to do with the fair, and that had to do with a, <clears throat> the, the, a bond issue for a very small portion of the fair funding, about $5 million, that was to go for the uh, city's part of putting in the infrastructure to the fairgrounds, water lines, and that kind of stuff. And the people uh, uh, voted 58% in favor of that, but it needed 60%. And that was the reason why Mayor Rogers called a meeting of the business community and said, okay, folks, it's up to you. We want to have an expo. The city has a major role to play in developing the site for expo. We can't do it without the money, the revenue necessary to do that job. The only source that we have available to us is a B&O tax. Now, you tell us, what do you want us to do? And the business community very reluctantly said, go ahead and vote it in. But they put a dollar limit on it. It was $5.7 million. And uh, at the time that that amount of money was raised, then the B&O tax came off. And uh, as I recall, it only took about two years to raise that amount of money. And the minute that, that total was reached, then we cut it off. That was the end of the B&O tax for that time. Passage of the B&O tax solved another problem that could have derailed the Expo project, but there was still areas of public dispute. Even as demolition began on the railroad trestles, a strong movement was underway to save some of Spokane's railroad heritage by leaving the train station standing. The Save Our Stations campaign divided households. Even my kids, a couple of my kids, thought that we ought to save that station. And uh, they had a great, great motto, SOS, you know. So those who wanted to get rid of the station prevailed. The main thing was that we, we had the railroads coming off the river, and, the, and even the, the, the Great Northern Station, which was next door and across the river, uh, is, is only left by the residual of a tower, which is there as a memory. But, but the station itself had no value at all. It, it just took up space on an already site that was already too small to put a World's Fair on. And we had a, another station, the, the Northern Pacific, a few blocks south, which someday, and it turns out now is happening, would be remodeled. While the business community in Spokane focused its attention on the Expo task, the rest of the world was concentrating on much different issues. I think that there's a little mischief going on with regard to the end of the war amendment. How serious of a problem will the gasoline situation be for the visitors from your state? Now, I am the chairman of the Western States Governors Conference, and we've been working on a great deal, and we feel that we will have a sufficient amount of gasoline. You're going to see uh, in the next 10 years a continuing movement to small, efficient packages on all car lines. I believe that the president uh, is guilty of, of uh, action that would warrant his dismissal. We've done some research uh, and development at the Bell Telephone Laboratories regarding all oh, the ultimate and portable telephones, you know, the kind that might resemble a, a uh, uh, James Bond thing like a, a pen where you talk into and so forth. We're not at that point, but we're looking at all the possibilities. In the early 70s, most people in Spokane paid only passing attention to this World's Fair idea. They were far too busy living their private lives to heed the commotion downtown. But there were a few people anxiously awaiting the fair's arrival. Using his 8mm movie camera, one man actually decided to capture the metamorphosis of this site from beginning to end. Ed Thompson is a self-appointed Spokane historian. Uh, really, I am, in a way, a historian, I guess, yeah. I have preserved things that nobody else has got. Nobody, nobody has got what I had on film, I know that. Because I was on it sometimes. I used to see people down there with a still camera, you know, taking snapshots once in a while. But there was, I was the only one with a movie camera that I knew of, anyway, when I was around taking pictures. And now I'm glad I did, because... Uh, a lot of people maybe get a chance to see this, whereas it lay in my basement for 20 years and never nobody ever looked at it. <laughs> now his film helps take us on a journey back in time. He was there when the double-decker trestle nicknamed the Chinese Wall 
fell to the wrecking ball in 1972. And as he chronicled the countdown displayed in the clock tower, there were times when he thought they would never get it all done by opening day. No, I didn't because in, in my movies and uh, I was saying, gosh, the, the days, you know, they, they had the days on the, on the clock tower up there, uh, how many more days to expo? And I thought, how in the dickens are they ever going to get this done by that time? Those directly involved in the project wondered this too, but at the same time, they felt great pride in what they had already accomplished. I used to come down from my home here, I used to go down the hill, uh, down Grand Boulevard, and then on down uh, Washington Street, come out and come underneath the trestle on Washington Street and look up, and there I would, I would see nothing but a big trestle across my vision, which was on Trent, which is now Spokane Falls Boulevard. The morning, the morning I came out from under and there was nothing there, I just, in my heart, I knew that if nothing else worked from that day on, Spokane had done most of its job. It, the, the main thing was finished. They could, they could handle everything. It'd be costly, it'd be time consuming, it'd be full of, of no fun, but it would be done. But the work was over when, this, when that happened. And that's how good, it, that's how big it was for us in Spokane. Even as the old structures came down, crisis management continued to be a way of life for the Expo project. In the early going, we kind of stumbled around uh, a little bit in, in getting it the fair off the ground. And we had some uh, fits and starts, and there were a couple of times when, uh, when we went home at night, we thought, well, it's all over, we aren't going to go ahead. And a lot of it had to do with funding and putting together the, just all of the many different things that had to come together from the railroads uh, deciding almost on a minute's notice to, you know, vacate the site to getting the caliber and the, and the quantity of exhibitors that we needed to make the show a success, lining up all the entertainment events. Uh, it was a remarkable undertaking for a community this size. As demolition on the site continued, King Cole traveled the world trying to secure foreign exhibitors. In May of 1972, the Soviet Union shocked skeptics and thawed a little Cold War ice by announcing its participation. The USSR was the first country to commit to Expo 74, the first World's Fair with an environmental theme. This is uh, an area that has always been concerned with the environment. Many people would disagree with that, but it is an area where people have been interested in outdoor activities, been interested in making the, the outdoors a big part of their life, skiing, hunting, fishing, you name it. So it was a natural that man and his environment was a topic that came up very quickly in the discussion. The theme of celebrating tomorrow's fresh new environment also seemed natural because of the site. Nature is what made this place so appealing. Enclosed in this 100 acres are two islands and a series of cascading waterfalls that rival any across the country, especially when you consider their location at the heart of the city. The environmental theme gave Spokane a chance to clean up the site and the river, but it did not necessarily please area environmentalists. Well, the idea of, of, uh, of cleaning up that ghastly downtown area with all the overhead railways and that kind of thing was, 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 uh, was something that interested me a lot. Uh, the idea of, of doing something that would focus on the environment was something that interested me a lot. But uh, from the outset, I was kind of suspicious about the, about the people who were putting it together because that, uh, that, that, that didn't appear to be a group who was, well, I knew very well it wasn't a group who was involved in the environmental movement in Spokane. Uh, and it's, my belief was, and, and still is, that the folks who put those things together are primarily interested in, in economics and not, uh, and not the environment. We were criticized a lot for, well, you're really putting on a show, it's not really an environmental fair, but we did uh, do a lot to stick with the theme. We had, a, 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 during the course of the fair, we had an environmental symposium series, uh, and we did insist that some of the, uh, you know, the development would be environmentally sensitive, and it's hard to do when you have an entertainment event, but nevertheless, uh, I think in the long run, it, it really worked, and it, and it made Spokane much more environmentally conscious than it ever was before. 
There are those who disagree and think Expo officials had to be prodded into following an environmental track while developing the fair. But there is no denying that with encouragement from area environmentalists, a monumental step was taken. A then relatively new procedure called an environmental impact study was done on the Expo site. I believe we were the first entity in the state of Washington. We may have been the first entity related to any federal program to file an environmental impact statement in the United States. Though the timely theme caused some extra work, it was not one of the major problems Expo officials had to overcome. The main problems dealt much more with the problem of selling the idea internationally that Spokane could have a fair, getting the international exhibitors to commit early enough so that you could get domestic exhibitors to commit, getting down payments of money to match with all the pledges and all the early risk financing. I mean, this community, which is not a large one, had to risk millions and millions of dollars without even knowing if we could ever reach opening day. Part of those millions went into marketing the area. Spokane, Washington, site of the World Environmental Fair. Films like this were made to show Spokane off. It is much easier to sell the idea of a place when people know something about it. And the more interesting the place looks, the better. For this reason, it was decided to market not just Spokane, but the entire Northwest. Within an easy day's drive from Expo 74, you'll find the rugged Cascade Mountains of Washington, Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks, as well as the treacherous Snake River and Hell's Canyon country of Idaho. That was a, a, that certainly a strategy because uh, although we knew that our, our attendance was probably going to come from a 300 miles radius, a lot of the spots, though, did try to, particularly outside of Washington State, try to attract people to the total Pacific Northwest, the Canadian Rockies, the, the coast, uh, certainly Glacier National Park, so that it wasn't just to stop at the fair. And that seemed to work, too. They also used big names to help draw interest to the fair. I'm on the road again, this time to Expo 74 in Spokane, Washington. It's so lush, you wouldn't believe it's Crosby's hometown. Spots like this worked great, but Mike Koblick remembers the long, hard road to getting people like Bob Hope interested in the fair. Joe Rosenfield used to ask me to come to the board of directors meeting and make a presentation on what's happening in entertainment. And of course, for the first year or two, I would go to some of these meetings and I would have to report that, uh, well, uh, so far, the jumping jills who do a skip rope act from, I don't know where, from, uh, from the Tri-Cities, tri right, <laughs> is, is going to be on the site for two performances. And of course the board of directors would yawn and just say, oh my gosh, is that really the, the extent to which we're going and is that really where we're headed? And then I'd come back a week later and have to give another presentation. Well, we have written all these letters and we've done all this stuff and we've had these calls in and we're making progress and and now we have the marching band, the high school marching band. And it started off real slow. It may have started slow, but it ended strong. Anybody who was anybody during the early 70s made their way to Expo 74. Never before or since would so many big name entertainers be in Spokane during such a short period of time. Someone said that we're going to be the entertainment capital of the world for six months. And I have to tell you that I cringed when I first heard that because I thought, are you kidding? I mean, Spokane, Washington, yes, it's going to be important. Yes, it's going to be great. But really, the Spokane the capital of entertainment in the entire country, next to New York and Los Angeles and Seattle and whatever. But doggone, as I look back on it, uh, I think we were. We had an extremely important series of events uh, that were both international in, in nature, that were local in nature, that were regional in nature, um, and that offered a wide variety for, for everything for everyone who wanted to, to see or do something over six months. Before the visitors could come, the site had to be completed. Ground was broken for the U.S. Pavilion in the fall of 1972. It would be the focal point of both the fair and Riverfront Park. Keep in mind, we had to plan a fair, and then we had to plan it in a way that six months later when it went away, the park would be left in a state that we would want the park to be, and those are two different 
entirely different equations. So first you do your master plan for what the fare should be, and then you say, but does this make any sense? Are we leaving behind the kind of park that we want to leave behind? But the concept was to put, the obviously, the Federal Pavilion at the center, at the top part of Havermail Island there, where at the northern edge, where it could be um, the center of both the fair and the residual pavilion could be at the center. And I think that worked very well. And then we did sort of a radio theory around it with the international governments right around it, and then the domestic exhibits were farther out to the edge. Uh, that was uh, twofold. One was, one of the reasons was we thought that would be a nice relationship. The other was we built the international exhibitry, and so we wanted to be able to build that in a tight area. We allowed the uh, domestics to build their own. We built some, but they, uh, they were able to build their own. Those were the most, uh, those were the greatest quantity of unknowns. Well, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna leave a gap, you'd rather leave it at the edges and bring the fences in than you would in the center. So that was some of that master planning process. And what a master plan it was. In spite of all the obstacles, Expo 74 opened in Spokane on May 4th to a crowd of 85,000 people. Uh, three and a half years, uh, we went from a site that we didn't own with railroads crossing it um, to a brand new open World's Fair all built open within budget on opening day. For the six months Expo 74 ran, every day was like the 4th of July. Each and every one even ended with fireworks. In fact, the fair marked the kickoff of the country's bicentennial celebration. From the opening ceremonies on, the first Environmental World's Fair was a hit. Everywhere its Mobius strip symbol with green for the growing things, blue for the water, and white for the air, represented our eternal link to the environment. Divided into color-coded sections with giant butterflies marking the gates, the site itself was a very user-friendly environment. The grounds were designed so visitors could see it all in about three days, but many spent even more time taking in the sights here. The most prominent of the sights to be seen was the U.S. Pavilion, Perched at the top of the newly landscaped Havermill Island, it was the largest pavilion at Expo and one of three structures designed to remain after the fair closed. The United States government erected this web of steel and vinyl to house a courtyard and exhibits showing the federal approach to environmental issues, plus the world's largest IMAX theater screen. Nine countries besides the United States had pavilions scattered across the fair site. Canada teamed up with the provinces of British Columbia and Alberta to transform Cannon Island into Canada Island. After years of industry, the emphasis was once again placed on the area's natural beauty. Hi, welcome to Canada Island. As you can see, we have an awful lot of fun down here. Korea, the Republic of China, and Japan all brought a feeling of the Orient to the fair. And the Pacific Rim met Europe when the Philippines and West Germany shared a building the Philippines showed the beauty of tradition. So in our pavilion, we are not only showing a documentation of uh, environmental problems. But While West Germany used modern technology to display the fair's environmental theme. Technology and industry have given us prosperity. 
but they've also brought hazards to the environment. Polluted air, contaminated water, mountains of garbage, incessant noise. Another pavilion located on the river's edge became home to our neighbors down under. The Australians were popular hosts at Expo 74. Could you open it up for me? Mm. And there's a little gift for Mommy in <laughs> memory of the being the 100,000th visitor to our mm. pavilion. Oh, I see some And there's a little bit of uh, warm you up for Dad. <laughs> this is part of the Australian pavilion, right next to the beautiful Spokane River and Falls. We're going to show you a lot about Australia at Expo 74. We're going to show you about our ancient country and its beauty. We're also going to show you about some of the terrible tragedy that man has made on the earth. The Australians were fabulous. The Australians used to have above their exhibit a small dining area. And the, the Australians loved to, uh, to have uh, dinner parties, and late dinner parties usually. So after a performance on the Opera House stage, they would invite certain, certain artists over for a wonderful dinner, a wonderful evening. Looking back at the fair can illustrate how the world changes. In 1974, Iran was an ally of the United States and openly shared its culture with the world at its pavilion. And the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was also represented at Expo 74. Whether it was due to its overwhelming size or the mystique of its cool relationship with the United States, people went to see the 54 and a half thousand square foot building in droves. For many, this was the first real look at a land and people they had been raised to distrust. We had a lot of fun with the Russians. Uh, and then, you know, the Soviet Union and the U.S. were not the best uh, of friends. And, and the Soviet uh, uh, people that were here were really great and, and charming people for the most part. But we also had, you know, they had the KGB agents and stuff. Uh, that was kind of interesting. While being in the United States everywhere, we felt hospitality. And I'd like to thank you for this warm and cordial reception. They couldn't go outside a certain uh, radius outside of Spokane. Uh, they always traveled in pairs. Uh, they were not allowed to, to go alone shopping or any of those things. So there were a lot of interesting kinds of cultural differences that we had to to overcome, I think, and understand. And I think that was all very positive for the community. Mixed among the forum pavilions were a seemingly endless parade of domestic exhibits and entertainment.
part of my job was to try to find the on-site entertainment, uh, to try to find the groups that were going to perform on the site. Uh, the concept was that every time you turned a corner, there was supposed to be something happening. So we were going to be looking for uh, the bands, the musical events, the clowns, the, the jugglers, the, the magicians, and, and those kinds of things to, all throughout the site so that uh, when a, a visitor came to the, the site, there would be not only the pavilions to see, but all of this free entertainment. One of the most popular areas to find an ever-changing variety of this free entertainment was the Folk Life Festival, located on the north bank of the river. What we wanted to do in Folk Life was bring people into immediate and prolonged contact with cultures and heritages and traditions and activities that they might not have had a chance to see before in their own lives. After all, Spokane at that time was a very old-fashioned city. I used to say it was like walking into a Booth Tarkington novel. There was a kind of the heavy hand of Anglo-Saxon mentality and, and mores that, that hung over this whole region. And people who weren't uh, of the British persuasion were self-conscious and, and often intimidated about expressing their own heritage. We asked ourselves what were the the heritages of occupations and traditions in the Northwest, railroading, logging, mining. Well, we had visitors come and pan for gold. And we had visitors uh, who we would have uh, logging shows three times a day, seven days a week for six months. And um, we would invite visitors to not to do chopping or, or buck sawing or anything like that, but we would, uh, we would invite them to do log rolling if they wanted to do it talked to railroad men. We had a Union Pacific locomotive on the site manned by old Union Pacific people. And so we had those. We had quilters who would invite people to come and sit down and work with them on the expo quilt, which they did. So those were kinds of the things that we had. We had boat builders from Puget Sound who came and actually built a, a wooden sailing ship during the six months of expo. Those were things that people would get into. And then every week, we had an ethnic group and uh, perhaps another cultural heritage group who would come and do things like cook or dance or play games, traditional things, tell stories, share things like that with visitors. The Folk Life Festival area at Expo 74 is this week featuring Ukrainian arts and crafts and entertainment. And fair growers are given a chance to participate in many of the exhibits and learn a little more about the Ukrainian culture. Are you baking all this stuff right on the grounds here? Yes, we are, with the exception of the two larger ones. They were brought in from uh, Vancouver, Canada, and the stoves here are not large enough. The ovens are not large enough, so we're not able to do it. But we are showing them, demonstrating them how to do these and how we make the twirls, how we make the various designs, how we make the doves. I've made a batch over there, as you can see, and uh, the various designs. And uh, this gives the people an idea just how we apply the various designs onto our wedding breads or into our Easter Paschas. And if things got a little slow at the festival, well, that was nothing a little gold rush couldn't solve. We had these wonderful, wonderful prospectors who were just uh, great with people. I mean, they were for real. They came from Murray, Idaho, and, and they, were they were miners for all of their lives. Anyway, they were very good at palming. Uh, little nuggets. Now there are no nuggets in gold in this area, but nobody knew that at the time. So they would come over and they would help someone uh, to pan for gold and they would say, now here's what you do and you've got to kind of swish it this way and that. And here from their palm, would, they would just let this nugget go into the thing. Oh my goodness, look what you got. And there would just happen to be a camera crew there watching it. Well, it was that kind of thing. The possibility of gold may have brought some people to the site, but all in all, it was the sharing of culture that seemed to have a lasting effect on everyone involved. I think that they recognized that they had something worthwhile in themselves. And we saw after Expo, a lot of these ethnic groups and cultures found a strength in themselves to keep on going and to, to, uh, to renew themselves and even to grow in, in strength and ability. If there was any, any legacy of the Folklife Festival, I would guess that that was it.
One of the most important legacies left to Spokane as a result of the fair are the Opera House and Convention Center. Oh, I think without a doubt. We never would have had it without, uh, without Expo 74. The state paid about $10 million to build those facilities, and Governor Dixie Lee Ray sold it to the city for a dollar, and that's a bargain. And we never would have been able to finance or fund uh, that type of a facility, and of course it's been used and, and appreciated by so many people, not only for Spokane, but for the whole in the Northwest. For the first time in Spokane, crowds of up to 2,700 people could gather to see world-class productions in a world-class facility. I remember Bing Crosby coming in, who did not perform at the World's Fair, but who came as a guest and standing on the stage and, and saying, oh, let me try this out, ba 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 boo. And he said, oh, this is, this is really a fabulous auditorium. I'm gonna have to come back here and play sometime and whistle off, but we never could get him to come back. <laughs> Bing Crosby didn't play this house, but many others have. And it all started with the parade of world famous performers that came to Expo 74. The Opera House was built as uh, part of the state's participation in the World's Fair, and it lifted Spokane's performing arts capability to a new and un unknown level. And certainly the attached convention center, and now the Ag Trade Center with that, put Spokane in a different league as far as meetings and conferences are concerned. Uh, more than that, I think what the World's Fair did, as far as I'm concerned, is it made people understand that we can do things in Spokane, that, that we don't have to take a backseat to anybody, and that, uh, that the sky's the limit and imagination is the only limitation. During the six months the fair was open, more than five million people came through these gates to see just what Spokane could offer. And it was hard to find anyone who was disappointed. I think the community tolerated it up to opening day, they were impressed by opening day, and they bought into it about four days later, maybe a week later, because they found out it was exactly what it was represented to be. Spokane sometimes is a bit reluctant to accept that which is stated on a public issue. And in this particular case, uh, they found out that it was exactly what it was supposed to be and then you couldn't find anyone who voted against them. They had all moved out of town. And it was sort of fun to see that happen because uh, those that had been some of the biggest critics all of a sudden were pretty proud of what they saw and the fact that it was really moving and, and doing well. We had a wonderful summer. But as with all things people seem to hold most dear, the summer inevitably came to an end. The fair closed on a dark and cold November night. President Ford was now in office, but he was not present. His message to the crowd was recorded. The fireworks were grand, but similar displays had been seen every night for the past six months. In short, the closing did not have the same pomp and circumstance of the opening, but it did serve its purpose. Those responsible for Expo 74 were happy it was over. They were also proud of what it had been. The memory for me is that uh, uh, after the ceremony was all over, people I knew were out in the audience came up to me and everybody was crying. You know, couldn't we keep it going a little longer? Oh, it's so beautiful, I will never forget it. And I just had a terrible time to keep from smiling. I was so happy it was over. You know, it was such a, it was such a stretching, uh, stressful kind of a thing to, to go through and to have it happen without any serious mishaps or problems, to have it come, come off the way it was supposed to do that uh, I just, I, I, I probably shouldn't have smiled as heavy as I did, but I, I sure was glad it was over. Because you'd completed what you'd set out yeah, to do? Yeah, it was done, it was done well. And uh, I was glad for everybody in Spokane who, who took so many risks and worked so hard. And so many of them had to leave town because that was, a, was, that was their job. And they would have nice memories of us, but uh, 
Uh, but I mean, the Commissioner General who went on to become an ambassador from Canada, and uh, he came back here just to visit uh, one time uh, at a, some sort of a commemoration. And he said he'll never forget Spokane. He says that's the fair of all expos, and he's been to all of them now. Uh, he's been the pres he's been the president of the Bureau of International Expositions in Paris, and he said this is the one, not the big one, not the expensive one, not the one with uh, great excitement. But he said this is the one that he remembers as being the one that was so perfectly conceived and and so well delivered, with, and has such a warm feeling to it. Now that's a great, pretty nice way to have anybody leave leave you when they leave town. The day after the fair closed. Workers were already busy tearing the place apart. The first priority occurred last night. We removed 289 light bollards off of the site to protect them from damage. And the warehouse crew and uh, grounds crew worked all night. And this morning, why the uh, concessionaires started to move in and uh, take out their concessions. And in fact, some of them were already completely gone. And after this process, why the international pavilions and the domestic pavilions will remove all of their uh, material. And then we will go into the phase of uh, actually removing 243,000 square feet of buildings and concrete and so forth. As much as some would have liked it to remain as it was during Expo, it would not. And on purpose, the Bureau of International Expositions gave us permission to have an exposition of a ca special category, which one of the requirements was that there, none of the buildings were, were permanent. We had to take them all down. And we liked that because we wanted to have a park. And uh, it's, the more you leave up, the harder it is to get rid of them. So they, we could just say, I'm sorry, the rules are set. We have to take them down. By design, only three buildings remained where they were during the fair. Its vinyl top is now just a memory, and the IMAX theater has been moved to the side. But the U.S. Pavilion is still a prominent fixture of the Spokane skyline. The Opera House and Convention Center, which has since been expanded, are also city landmarks and the unique copper-topped building which was the temporary home to the Bavarian beer gardens during the fair was always meant to be the permanent home of the now beloved carousel. After the fair, the city wasted little time transforming this area into a park. That's what we were committed to do and we honored that commitment. But um, I think probably the most important contribution that that park has made to Spokane is that it has provided a kind of an anchor to downtown. That, that downtown Spokane is different than most other downtowns because it has Riverfront Park, see. And uh, even though that has seen its peaks and valleys since Expo 74, it's still there and it's still functional. And uh, it's still to a very, very commendable degree serving the purpose for which it was intended. The park itself is an important legacy to Spokane residents, but so is the self-esteem which was built along with it. Probably more than any other measurable impact, it was in uh, their opinion of themselves, in um, their, their own ego as a community. That uh, up until that time, you know, Spokane had been just a, a nice sort of a railroad town that had grown up because there were a lot of wheat fields around us and a lot of mines to the east of us. But uh, beyond that, why, you know, we really weren't all that much. But then all of a sudden, we're a good enough, and big enough, and strong enough town to put on an international exposition. And, uh, and I think it changed, at, at least for those days, the, uh, the image that people had of themselves in Spokane, that we are different, that, uh, uh, we are Spokane. Now some people may say these are qualities that people of this city no longer possess. But others believe you just have to know where to look. You've got to keep on being nice to each other and, uh, and being thoughtful. Not only thoughtful to each other, but thoughtful in the buildings you build, thoughtful in the way you're, you, you, uh, you, uh, you raise your children, thoughtful in the ch way the children act, and the way that uh, business people treat the, their employees and treat each other. It's very, we're very close to always being successful in that. We've always been right on the edge of, of, uh, of major success, and we came there, and during the fair we hit it because, it, because the, the stimulus was there. 
and it'll come back at full bore any time we want it to, if we want it to. What the future holds for Spokane and the park is another story we will have to wait for time to reveal. However, there's no denying the impact that Expo 74 had on Spokane. Countless people gave part of themselves to make it and this park a reality. And they realized that most of the people that enjoy it today and in the years to come will never even know their names. But as one Expo official put it, that's okay. As long as Spokaneites do remember that once there was a generation that cared enough about this city's future to give its people a legacy they can be proud of.